All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to night two, Overcoming the Obstacles. We are meeting with Laurie, who you met on the show last week. She's back again, and we're going to talk about some of the other obstacles that she's overcome. But before we go any further, I want you to do something for me. I want you to smash that subscribe button and join the channel if you have not already joined. And definitely go ahead and give me a like on that video, so just hit that thumbs up. Uh, and I want to thank you in advance for sharing this on your social media. My links are down below, and Laurie's links are down below. So, what I'm going to do now is I am going to let Laurie tell you a little bit about herself, and we're just going to kind of dive right in now on overcoming the obstacles, especially since you've already subscribed, and thank you for doing so and for hitting that like button. Okay, Lori, turn it to you now. Tell me a little bit about yourself, and we'll go from there. Okay, well, it's good to be back, Gail, and I really appreciate having this opportunity again to speak. I thank you. Well, it's a, it's a nice opportunity to share, and I love what you're doing. I've had the opportunity to watch a few of your shows, not all of them, but a few of the Overcoming the Obstacles, and uh, they're just so important for people, so, you know, people will know, you know, there are many people struggling, and, you know, many people that have overcome so much, and again, we just need to keep trying, keep going, and so I love your show. <laughs> oh, thank you. We love you because you're what makes it a success. People like you coming on the well, show. Well, I'm just uh, last week we were talking about mainly the um, issues of uh, child abuse and growing up in that sort of situation, and the struggles that I had with with that. Um, and we left off um, sort of in my adult life, you know, working on getting through my healing journey, which I did start in 2007, roughly, and um, have been on that ever since. I didn't go to do any therapy, real therapy. Um, I did this all self-help, mainly with books from uh, John Bradshaw and um, different different people like that who've written books, mainly John Bradshaw and um, a few other uh, authors out there who put out some really great books for survivors, adult survivors of child abuse. So I did the work on those. I really went and did the work, did the journaling. Um, got into some support groups which i found very helpful and um yeah it was wonderful to be able to reach out to people that understood where i'd been you know where, where i was coming from and you know the difficulties i was facing and um all these hands just kept reaching out because i was reaching out these hands were reaching back to me and it was like i didn't i was no longer alone in this mess you know so it was great and then i moved to canada uh well i'd already talked about that i did move to canada in 19 95 so I've been up here a while now <laughs> almost half my life and um, my I met my husband and that's what we're, that's where we were talking about the show uh, the internet went out <laughs> so I was just kind of going on about that but um I, yes, met, it did. I was I was talking to you and I heard this like little thud boom and then like all of a sudden right. nothing Laurie was gone no internet <laughs> just boom so <laughs> thanks for being willing to give me another try hopefully no more telephone calls it was gone. In our I, was, I was still talking but yeah it was funny i was like where did gail go <laughs> i was here by yeah boom because like, like all of a sudden hey, she's there is nothing but it's all good now and um thankfully and so i met We're planning the, on it staying that way the most wonderful man and you know i mean we hit it off right away um we just had a lot in common as far as what we liked and what was important to us in life. Um, and we just became really good friends. And before you knew it, we fell in love. And um, yeah, we were a couple. And both of us, he was previously married, had two children, two boys. He didn't raise them because his, his ex-wife lived in England and he lived over here in Canada. So his that had to be wife really hard for him. had full custody and he didn't, that was one sadness in his life is that he didn't get to see much of his sons. One of his sons he never even met. And wow. Yeah, because he was, uh, I hadn't been born yet um, when they divorced. And so he always had, there was always a bit of sadness about him, about Cecil, my husband. And um, 
he would always talk about his sons, you know, very fondly, especially the one that he had um, helped to, you know, to raise for five years. And so uh, that was always kind of hard on him. I know, you know, he was lonely. When we met, I, I was just leaving this abusive past behind. Or I, was, I was thinking that I was leaving behind anyway. And um, we just, yeah, we just started on this journey. And uh, <laughs> it's like he, he worked as a, as a cook, and so did I. We were both cooks. And um, we used to work, we used to cook on the trains here in Alberta cooking for CP rail. And so that's what we did for a while. And he, then he got injured and I couldn't do the train anymore. So we ended up coming into Edmonton and, and uh, getting a, an apartment. And we were like, you know, do we really want this? You know what I mean? Um, the two of us were older, you know, I was like, I don't know, you know, but we, after about a year, you know, we felt like we were definitely in love and we just should be a couple. And so we just, Continued on our life together, yeah. And so we, we were together about 25 years. <laughs> That's a long time. Wow, congratulations. That's a, and it was, you know, we had our ups and downs, and it, it was tough. Like, he had been diagnosed in 2001 with, um, so six years into our relationship, he was diagnosed terminally ill. And he had uh, liver disease, and the doctors were giving him two to five years to live. And it was, um, it was very tough to deal with. Like, you know, we decided that we weren't going to let that destroy our, our life, you know, because we thought, hey, if we only have, like, if you only have two to five years to live, you know, we need to um, do everything that we can to just enjoy the rest of the time that we have, you know, instead of letting that destroy what little time that we had. So we just. That had to be difficult. Yeah. Yeah, it was hard. It was very hard. You know, um, it was on it was on Valentine's Day when when he got the diagnosis, and I was <laughs> I was in the car and it was cold. It was like minus thirty, freezing cold, snow, and I, I had the heat going. I was trying to stay warm in the car, and he comes up. Oh, dang! You know, and he opens the car door and gets in and sits down, and shuts the door, and he's like, "Honey, I'm dying," and I was just like. <laughs> Oh, you, this is not real, you know, like unbelievable. Like it's Valentine's Day and you're telling me you're dying. I was like, <laughs> so I, I had a little meltdown in the car and I thought, well, I got to drive us home. So um, it was a shock. It was a definite shock to both of us. And it took us a little while to get our bearings, you know, and we decided like, you know, do the best we can to, to help them stay alive as long as we could. And the doctors were like, we don't know. I mean, you could have 10 years, 15 years, but we're giving you two to five and we have to go with what we see, you know, and uh, that's, that's, you know, the best guess, right? There's no way of really telling. Um, so we were like, Hey, well, let's just live and enjoy our time. And so that's what we did, but we just kept right on doing that. And he lived another 17 years. <laughs> so, 17 years is a it's a long time, but you know, doctors don't know everything. They call it practice because it's not exact, but somehow you made it through. Yeah, we did. And I mean, like, I'm, you know, there were tough times and there were some difficult times and, uh, you know, but overall we looked back on it. We were just like, you know, we had a good life. We could have let that destroy us and totally be the, defining factor of our happiness and our joy and you know and just ruin everything and we were we were like no let's not do that let's do life and let's just enjoy and do what we can so because of his situation he could no longer work so but he was terminally ill so the government um paid you know gave him a, a you know a benefits right so so he had benefits so that was cool i was still working working all the time and um he he would go in and out of hospitals, you know, in over the years to the 17 year period that he was sick. Um, he would have about two or three times a year, he'd end up in the hospital, which was always very stressful for me because it was never any really good news. They were always like, you know, he might not be able to, he might not make it. He might not be coming out. One time I, it, this was back in 2010, they said he wasn't coming back out. And, um, I was just like, well, you know, <laughs> I said, I got more faith than that. And I said, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm a Christian. So I was like, you know, 
uh, it's up to God whether he comes home with me or whether he goes home to be with God. And that the, the doctor was just like, well, that's great. You know, <laughs> we just had telling you like it is. And I'm like, that's okay. I'm going to hold on to my faith. And sure enough, he came home with me. And he had, he had cancer. He beat cancer even with this liver disease. His liver became cancerous. And he had, they gave him two months to live. This was in, this was in 2010. And he, they said, you know, we can do this one treatment. It's the only option. And if it doesn't work, you, you know, you're going to go right within a very short period of time. But it's the only thing we can do to try to help you. So he did the treatment and he beat it. <laughs> and he oh lived gosh, another wow. eight years. I know. It was just, you know, the times that... You know, a person, it's so hard on a person, these kind of things, because you're just sitting there and you're just praying and you're just like, because, you know, for six months after he had that treatment, he was pretty well just laying in bed, kind of looking like he was dying, <laughs> you know, just really sick because of this uh, taste treatment where they put cobalt on the actual cancer to kill it. And it can kill you. See, that's the problem. That cobalt could either do one of two things. It can kill the cancer or it can kill you. That's why it's a 50-50 chance. So he was laying there for like six months in, 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 in his bed here, you know, um, just sick, really sick. And I was just sitting there and I'm just like, those are the times, you know, when it's like you it really tests your faith and what kind of person you are. You know, I was just like, I'm not giving up. You know, he's not giving up. I'm not giving up. And let's just keep going. And he beat it. And six months later, he went back in for his checkup, and they were like, "It's gone. The cancer's gone." We, I was like, <laughs> just, "Just amazing." Wow. I've seen some, There's no other words than amazing. Yeah, I've seen. I've just seen some really amazing things, and I know that it was a, a power much more higher than than anything here on earth. You know, I was just like, "This is so amazing." So and he, the doctors were really shocked because of his because of his health and his situation. They were just like, they were like, "You're like a walking miracle, buddy." <laughs> you know, it's like, he really was. It sounds like a miracle to me. Yeah, he was, and um, he was just really strong. He was a very strong, strong man, strong person, and um, just determined to keep going. You know, his attitude was always. I learned a lot from him because I grew up abused. My parents were always uh, in a crisis, um, domestic violence, domestic abuse, and they they didn't work together as a team, and they never came together on anything, and they were both suffering all the time. Whereas Cecil and myself, you know, he taught me a lot um, by him being strong and him by his attitude of, hey, it's not a crisis. This is just life. We're going to get through this. You know, we're, we're going to go you know and so I developed that attitude I took that on for myself and I thought that's the way to live because none of us know what is going to come tomorrow none of us sure and we all you know so many people are facing so many things all the time um we never know like tomorrow isn't promised anyway and it's not promised that there won't be troubles so we have to there has to be something inside you know and it's a, it's it's uh um, it's much better and easier on a person's mind, body, you know, the whole psyche to realize that a lot of things are not in our control. Actually, most things are not in our control. The only thing we can really control is how we're going to deal with something and how we're going to let that affect us, you know. So I learned a lot from him. He was very wise. <laughs> he was a wise man. And I really paid attention. I learned a lot from him. And he gave me a lot of strength, you know, to, to be able to get through this stuff. So instead of being crushed by it, you know, it was it, it was definitely difficult. But it was like, hey, things happen, you know, things just this is just life, and it's just our life, and we want to enjoy it, not not let it ruin the whole thing. So he ended up passing away um, August 2018, and he really struggled the last year. It was very difficult for him because he was in a lot of pain and very very sick. And I, we both knew that his time was coming relatively shortly because he was just going downhill. <laughs> I mean, it was really bad. He was suffering big time. And I was sad to think of him not being here with me, you know. But then at the same time, I was like, you know, watching him suffer is so, you know, it, it was in this apartment. I haven't moved. You know, I'm still in the same place. And 
just knowing that he's in the next room just suffering and and really you know in so much pain so much torment in his body that I thought you know it's going to be like a blessing when he does go because it was hard to to know that he was suffering and I couldn't help him there was really nothing I could do he was on max morphine any more morphine would have killed him they were like you know he'd been on max morphine for like 10 years so I mean it was like um he was that's how bad the pain was for him and I just used to feel so bad for him um it's you know I in the meantime I had dealt with all of my own abuse issues during this whole period of time that we were together and that's so it was very difficult to do Uh, (laughs) along with all of that dealing with that um it's kind of like it was It sounds like you almost didn't know which end was up because he was sick for so long and he was suffering and you couldn't help him. Yeah, yeah. And when he did pass away, I mean, he was like, well, I don't know what you're going to do, you know, because he knew about about all this stuff that I was working on and all these things that I was doing, Um, you know, to be a a public voice for, you know, for survivors and to speak out against child abuse. I mean, he was well aware of what I was doing (laughs) and he liked it. He thought that was great. He was like, more power to you because he read my books too. And he was like, that's awesome. (laughs) So he was my kind of my biggest supporter. Um, he was like, well, when I go, I just, I don't know what you're going to do, hon, you know, I mean, because he knew I was going to be very isolated and, you know, no family, nobody to really, you know, to really pick up where he leaves off, you know what I mean? And I told him, I'm just going to keep going, you know, I'm just going to keep going. I said, because we have to keep going until we don't go anymore. Because that's what I used to tell him all the time, because he was so yeah. sick all the time. I mean, he'd be like, well, I'm sorry, you know, I'm just so not... I can't, I'm not, because there would be days where he wouldn't be able to even sit up. He was just, you know, sleep, sleep, sleep. Um, You'd have to just be medicated to sleep all the time because he was so sick. And, um, and I'd be like, no, I mean, we just go until we can't go anymore. That's all we can do. Right. I said, there's going to be a day where, you know, it's going to come where you can't do it anymore. And there's going to be a day come where I can't do it anymore. (laughs) You know what I mean? This is life, right? Um, but it's still hard. To, to, it sounds like you have to accept it. No, it's, it's not hard. easy. And um, you know, we're just thinking about him just for the holidays. Now, I didn't do um, August of the year 2018 when he passed away. That 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 winter, I actually was just grieving and grieving his loss. And I had studied a lot about grief in the working through the child abuse stuff because the adult survivor issues, dealing with the grief and and all of that. And so um, I was a little better prepared for it than I might have been had I not done that pre, pre-study of it. Um, it doesn't matter. It was still very difficult. There were times where I actually thought I was going to die. Like I felt my spirit wanting to leave my body just out of sheer sadness. And, um, you know, there's a, it's very traumatic losing, your, losing someone that close to you. You know what I mean? Your partner in life, husband, wife, you know. Um, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, people that, you, you know, you give your heart to, um, or even children, like family members, it's difficult. Um, and there's never any easy answer. I would say to people, you know, I know sometimes people want to put a pat answer on the whole thing and say, it'll get better. And, you know, you just need to not focus on that and think about other things. They try to help by giving you advice. Yeah. Sometimes people just don't know what they say. So they say anything to fill that space and it just comes out sounding stupid. I know yeah. it doesn't, you know, it, it, and those comments are coming from people that just want to be helpful. You know what I mean? They don't mean to be, to come across that way, but when you're grieving and they're hurting, that's the last thing you need to hear. <laughs> Basically, it's better, you know. It may be that they want to give you hope, but I think they just don't know what to say. Yeah, and I think people genuinely, because I've been there myself, you know, some some crisis, some terrible news has come across my my in my life, and I'm like, how do you respond to that? There's no hope in that. You know what I mean? Basically, it's just being there for the person and saying, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. If you need to call me at 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, you call. If you need me to come over there and just hold you and hug you, just hold your hand, I'm there. You know, that's what you that's what you need during those times. But when you don't have a family, it's difficult because his family was all, all of his family lived, uh, lives elsewhere, like all over right. Canada, like his siblings. So they're all nobody close. And I wasn't close with them, really. Um, 
And he wasn't really either, so it's kind of never really developed a relationship there. So it was just me and him. Yeah. So I knew I was going to be on my own in this, and I not really because you know I'm very, I'm a person of faith, and I know that God is with me. But um. Well, yeah, and there's it's it's like that joke where somebody's talking and they're talking about talking to God, and then they say, "Yeah, but it's nice to talk with somebody that's got skin on once in a while." It's that human connection, right? Because we are still, we're here on the earth. We're here, you know, amongst other people, you know, but you, 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 you need that too. Right. And I mean, I, I do have friends here in Calvary who are really as supportive as they could be. You know, I really, um, you know, we're not that close, but, we, but they know my situation. They've actually tried to be a big help to me. Um, you know what I mean? Over the years, especially over the last couple, just knowing that Cecil passed away. And because they had met him and they knew who he was and they really, you know, felt bad for me. They, there isn't really not much people can do because even when those, let's say you do have a lot of people around, a lot of times family or friends, this, I've seen this in other situations. Um, and then when they go home, there's the silence. You're left there with, you're still going to have to deal with that silence and that separation. Um, it is difficult, absolutely. And, and I mean, until you go through that, it's not something I sat around thinking about so much. Um, what do you do with yourself? You know what I mean? In the afterward, in the silence. And I, I did a lot of study on the grieving and all that, like I said before. And I, the funeral home that I went through gave me a book on grief, which was very helpful. And this book, yeah, it was, it's, it was 365 days. Um, so you'd read one chapter a day which was very helpful actually, because it was talking a lot about the stuff that we're talking about here. And, um, and I thought, you know, that's right. And I, I need to learn how to be in the space, the here and the now without him. He's not here anymore. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I need to deal and learn how to cope. Right. And it's been very hard. Um, and with the holidays, there's always some calendar event that comes around an anniversary you know, Christmas, birthdays, holidays of any type, any type will come around on the calendar. And this is the third Christmas that he's since he's been gone. And um, like I said, the first Christmas I was sick. So, and I was grieving. So I just stayed in bed and cried and blew my nose. It was just, I had a bad cold and I was just devastated. So I was like, I'm not going anywhere. I stayed in bed and I actually was okay with that because I thought I need to. What I was going to say to people is that a lot of times, because as a survivor of abuse, a lot of times people don't know what to say to you either. Um, and sometimes people will tell you to just get over it. Can't you just get over it? Move on with your life. Just think about the future. Don't worry about the past and that sort of stuff. And what I have learned in my adult survivor. That stuff is not helpful. It's not helpful. And I, I you know, and some sometimes it's just because people don't want to hear it. So they just don't want you to talk about it. Right. Oh, the issue it's, is it's a lot to, handle. to um, I would say for most, for anybody out there who's struggling or suffering this holiday season from missing a loved one, it's okay to feel those feelings. You know, it's okay to feel that grief and that sadness and that sorrow because obviously that, that person, or those people, whoever they are in your life that is not here any longer, were, were that important to you. So why would you dismiss those feelings? That's really sad. I agree. Um, you know, I think it just over time, I've noticed this is in the last two and a half years, things are getting better because I, I'm spending much less time crying about things. You know what I mean? Um, because the first year I, I spent a lot of time crying that first six months, like sure. August, September, October, November. <laughs> I really couldn't hardly even not cry. I, I'd try really hard not to cry, but I'd be crying by the end of the day. And the next year was a little bit better and I had to focus on just, you know, trying to keep, keep a job. 2019 was not friendly to me either. 20, I've got my own health issues as well. So Cecil, I, when, when, because of Cecil's issues and his health issues, I needed to be able to take care of him. And I knew I had some work to do on myself too, but I also, I thought, you know, I can't deal with my stuff because if I end up in the hospital, who's going to look after him? We were concerned they would separate us at some point. Yeah. There was an, because, you know, if a person becomes unable to look after another person, then they'll take the other person away. And I thought, you know, because, you know, they're looking out for the interest, the best interest of that 
person who was terminally ill, right? Okay. And I had to be able to prove that I could do this, you know, for, for, for him to be allowed to stay, which is unbelievable, but absolutely true, um, to be able to stay with me. Because we had home health care people coming in uh, once, twice a week usually, just to just to make sure everything was okay. That's a blessing. That can be a yeah. big deal. Yeah. And I mean, help. that's it, it was a great help. And they would bring supplies because supplies are expensive, like for wound, wound dressing, stuff like that. They would bring all that stuff with them. And they showed me how to do all the stuff so I could do it when they weren't there. And that was great. But you still have to be able to prove you can do it. So I couldn't afford to get sick. I was like, you know, I, and, I, and I really... I wasn't all that concerned with my own health at, while dealing with his stuff because I thought I can't deal. We had to go to so many doctor's appointments for him and, ho and hospital stuff that I thought if I got to throw mine in there, I'll never have time to do. I won't have time to work because I'm so busy trying to do this stuff. It's the whole so. juggling of like doctor's appointments. Who goes where? Who goes here? Are we even at the right doctor's <laughs> office? I mean, like, are we showing up on the right appointment for the right person on the right yeah, day? Yeah, and I know it does happen because as we, people get older, you know, senior citizens getting older, uh, even, uh, even people that aren't senior citizens can be in a home where there's more than one person who's ill, you know what I mean? And it's juggling wow. doctor's appointments and all this. Yeah, and I thought, I just can't handle that. <laughs> so I put my stuff off. But I knew I was having difficulties, but at last... The, about winter 2019, so last winter, um, I had a, a series of things happen within about a month that just threw me for a loop. Like my blood pressure started to get out of whack uh, with stroke level. And I didn't know that it was that high. I mean, I would have probably gone to the hospital or a clinic or something, but because um, I hadn't got it tested, but my heart was pounding. Was I felt like I was going to fall down and collapse on my legs. And I thought, you know, something's wrong. Like something's really wrong. And um, I was trying to keep as many hours at work as I could because my job was coming to an end because it was a seasonal job. And at the end of, of December, like in the wintertime, they shut down the markets where they are because there's not a whole lot going on until like March or April. And I thought, oh, I'm going to be without you know, funding. I'm going to be without money. I'm going to have to look for another job. So I had been looking for another job. In the meantime, trying to get as many hours as I could. And I was sick and I was getting sicker all the time. And I by December, I was just sick with a bad cold, um, like a horrible bug. I almost wonder if it wasn't COVID, like, because they were saying that some people did get COVID in the winter, but they didn't start logging it until whatever. I haven't been tested for COVID, and I should have got the test. But um, maybe I might still do that. But You can still get checked for the antibodies. I mean, if they show up, like, I got really sick back in February, and I had all of, well, let's just say a lot of the symptoms of COVID, but nobody knew to check for it. Then they tested me just about eight weeks ago and I had no antibodies. So the question is now, you know, did I have COVID and I just don't have any antibodies anymore? Or did I just have something that looked a lot like COVID? And I mean, we'll never know, but. It's really tricky. And I was like, well, I just felt, I mean, I was sick. I mean, really sick. Um, and uh, my car broke down and so and I couldn't afford the repair so all this stuff happened all just last winter all at the same time so I lost my job on the same day it was my last day of work my car broke down outside of the city so and I couldn't afford the tow it was outside of the city limits it was going to cost pretty penny to get this thing towed in but some people I was working with were at this marketplace it was the last day so we all said goodbye and they gave me a big bag of like gifts which was really nice and these people were really sweet they knew my situation they knew I was struggling and sick and I wasn't doing so well <laughs> and they were they, I think they felt a little bit sorry for me and they, they were super nice well they gave me a card and it was kind of fat and I thought I bet you they put money in there I thought maybe 50 bucks you know and I thought well that'll help towards the tow you know because I've got like so much money in the bank not much I think I had like 60 bucks or something in the bank literally to my name toes aren't cheap no 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 the toe was like it was, it was gonna be 180 dollars so i opened up that envelope and in the envelope was exactly 180 dollars was like one, yeah it was 176 and that's what the toe came to because i called the guy i said i need a toe but i, I only have so much money and how, how much is it going to cost he goes well I'll, I'll rate it for you in the meantime i had to wait two hours in the middle of the winter in the snow sitting outside on a major highway with traffic flying by in a snowstorm <laughs> with no heat. I was sicker than a dog, freezing, but I had a, a luck. Well, when you're in Canada, you got to 
you, you have to be a little smart. So I had a blanket in there. Um, I had warm gloves. I had a, a second pair of socks to change my socks because when your feet get wet and it's cold like that, then you end up with frostbite. So I changed my socks. So for dry socks, put different gloves on, put my blanket on, wrapped up in the blanket, and I was okay. But I'm telling you, I was pretty cold. And um, I was too far to walk. I mean, I was outside the city, right? So finally got the toe in, 176 bucks exactly. So that was so nice of those people because I told them, I said, you will never guess. But they wanted me to use that money. I guess they were giving it to me for food or rent or something. I said, I need. I had to tow my vehicle in. It cost exactly what you gave me. So it's almost like, you know, it's just obvious to me that the higher power of my, I call, you know, my God, I call him God, God the Father. Um, I'm a Christian. Is looking out for me all the time. <laughs> I was and he's okay. He started taking care of you before you needed that tow because it took a while for your nope. co-workers to get all this together, and there was forethought, and there was planning, yep. and somebody had to get the card, and so they put all of this together, yep. just in time to meet your need. I mean, only God yep. can do that. Yeah, it's just bizarre. So, but the, but the car, I, I had to take it to two, two different places. The first place had it for a month. And in the meantime, I was paying insurance on this car. Couldn't drive it. It was just at this at this shop. Yeah, and the guy, I still had insurance, like 186 bucks a month. I mean, this was costing me a lot of money. So I was like, um, insurance in Canada, well, any, anywhere is expensive. So I, um, I told him, I said, look, I, can't afford to keep this car if I can't drive it. I'm, it's, I'm paying insurance on it and I can't even drive it and I'm broke. I said, I need to have, um, I'm going to have to have it towed to another place. So I called this other shop and I said, I've got an issue. I've got to get the car towed from another shop for you to look at it. And he said, well, we'll tow it for you. And um, he told me the charge. It wasn't all that much because it was close, close to that place. Right? It's like $60 or something. And he says, we'll check it out, and um, we won't charge you if we don't fix your car. For, we'll give you a free estimate. And I was like, oh, that's cool. So I, they said, you just got to pay for the tow. I was like, okay, I'll pay for the tow. So they did, and it turned out to be the same exact thing. So now I knew the other shop wasn't lying because I wasn't so sure about that. Because it's better to have two mechanics look when it's something. Because it was going to cost me $1,500, yeah. So I didn't have 1500 to spend on that car. I didn't have any credit, no credit. No, nobody I could contact for money to say, hey, I need a loan or anything like that. And I didn't have a job. So no bank's going to give me a loan. You know? The bank's going to want their money. They're not going to lend you. If you're not, not without lucky. a job. <laughs> I'm telling you, I was like, well, then I have to let the car go. So I had to donate the car. And uh, that was a fiasco. I mean, I was so glad to do it. But sitting at a month, I told you. And you need your car. I mean, that's that's a good chunk of your life yeah, right there. Yeah. Well, it's just hard on, you know, I mean, I in my younger days, it wouldn't have been such a problem, but now I'm having difficulty walking. So because of a car accident that I had many years ago, and I, I don't even know, some of it might be from the abuse, because I had a lot of um, uh, physical abuse. And so I'm, so I think my hips and stuff might be from that. But the thing is, is this car accident was bad. And I was injured, and the my ankle had to be rebuilt, and it's all put back together with screws and uh, plastic. So it's rebuilt. Well, they told me they said when I had that surgery when I was 18, I had this car accident when I was 18. They said, you know, you're gonna have difficulty all your life with this. It's gonna be very painful, um, and you took about 20 years off your life, just so you know. <laughs> I'm like, thanks. Well, like, thanks for telling me, Doc. Right. Yeah, it was from the because they and the surgery took nine hours. I, I had to be under like out under anesthesia, anesthesia whatever for for nine hours. They said that's twice as long as an open heart surgery. Like they said, it's really hard on your body. So they said you're just going to have problems. They said we think you'll probably be in a wheelchair by fifty. Obviously, they were wrong at that estimate because you're not in a wheelchair, but. That had to be horrible to hear at such yeah. a young age. Yeah, well, yeah, because I'm 50. I, I hit 55 this year if I make it. <laughs> Two more weeks. I, I should be here. Um, we Two weeks. Hey, happy birthday early. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, I'm hitting 55. And uh, the good 55. So yeah, I'm still walking. You know, it's I'm so thankful, let me tell you. And I'm thankful that 
you know, this car accident that I had, I mean, this was my fault. I wasn't uh, actually over limit, like inebriated to that point, but I had been drinking. And these, I hit some water and gravel, spun out, we hit a tree. And the, they, the government actually came to pictures of my vehicle because they said it's a miracle any of us made it out of there. They had to get the jaws of life to get me out because I was underneath the engine. And my body went, uh, my, my ankle went through the steel floorboard and that's why it was shattered. It was completely shattered. It was just, it was hanging on. I mean, it was hanging there. <laughs> and they told me like in, before he said, you know, I'm going to try to save your foot. He said, now you have an option. I can take your foot off and you can get prosthetics. Or do you want me to save your foot? You know, that's the option that you have. And I, they said, we'll give you that option now before we go into surgery. I said, well, I'd like to save my foot because I'd like to be able to wiggle my toes. You know? And that's hard news at any age, but especially like as a teen. I was 18. I mean, I really now thinking about it, I was like, oh, man, I would have done something completely different because I didn't realize um, it was it did put a damper on my life for sure. Um, because it's been painful ever since. If I would have been able to get a prosthetic foot. I would have been able to probably still dance and do all kinds of stuff. <laughs> See, so I'm, but I didn't know at the time, you know, you make decisions, right? And you got to go with it. But well, you have to make your decisions based on what medical care says and they don't know the ultimate outcome. They just, yeah. they do their best. And the thing, yeah, that's right. And he wasn't even sure if he could save it. He said, you know, I'm going to try to, we'll try to save your foot. I don't know if we can or not because it's just so damaged but we'll try to save it because we know that you want it. So that's what we're going to do. So they did. And, um, you know, I'm still glad I can still wiggle my toes, but the thing is it's that uh, nobody died in the car accident. I was so thankful. Um, all the four, yeah, four people in the car, we all were injured, all my, my really good friends. And so it was heartbreaking. I'm just glad nobody died, thankfully. And, um, but that's caused me a lot of problems. So my walking isn't good anymore. And I, hobble around a lot if i walk one day for instance let's say i have to go out to a grocery store or something if i can get there like if it's not too much pain i'll take the bus because i don't have my car anymore this is difficult when i had my car it was a little easier right? <laughs> but now it's like okay now i'm on the bus or taking a cab or whatever um and walking around the store that's fine but the next day then i can't walk and this is where the doctors they don't quite see the whole full picture um, I went to, I, my, the one doctor that I had sent me to an orthopedic surgeon. I just explained, you know, the difficulties that I've been having and the, with this high blood pressure situation, we're doing tests and, um, trying to figure out what's going on. You know, they still don't know <clears throat> what the issue is because well, we're going to do a stress test next Friday because they said that should have been done a year ago with my first doctor. They were like, yeah, why didn't she do that for you? And I'm like, I don't know. I said, maybe it's this COVID-19, you know, has her mind somewhere else or something i said because she never i said i need a help with this you know what i mean obviously my blood pressure is not coming down she says well i don't know if it's just stress or if it's um body related well he said well why didn't she send why didn't she send you for a stress test i'm like i don't know i asked her for everything i said i need uh these tests done because i need to know what's going on in my body no nope. so it's very frustrating when doctors jump into a diagnosis of stress without checking things out. I mean, okay, granted. Now, stress does cause a lot of things, and I'm not beginning to say that because we have stress yeah, illnesses yeah. and we have to deal with them. But doctors sometimes jump into that, and I even had that happen in my own life. I kept having these weird experiences that were just bizarre uh, where I would fall, kind of lose consciousness, or kind of lose track of time, and so forth. And it wasn't until mm -hmm. I wound up in status yeah. for epilepsy. I was having back-to-back -back seizures, and mm -hmm. the doctor came in, when I was it the, in the hospital, they actually had to admit me, and he asked me, he said, how long have you had a seizure disorder? And I'm like, I don't have a seizure disorder. I'm like, I just have stress. And he's like, I'm sorry. He said, I'm looking. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I'm looking at your EEG. It's abnormal. How long have you had this? And so what had happened was all the doctors were attributing it to stress. And it was legit seizures. So, yeah, totally crazy sometimes. And that makes it hard. Mm -hmm. 
because we go into the doctor and we're like, listen to me, please. And, you know, some doctors will, and of course some mm -hmm. don't. And that's what makes it so hard. So I'm glad that you're getting some care. Right, right. It can be hard because, um, like some friends of mine were telling me, they were like, you really need to go get a different doctor. Like she's not, you know, this doctor that I was with, they said, you know, she's not, obviously whether she's interested in your situation or what, she's not doing her job. She's just blowing you off basically, right? Kind of like a whiner or something. Um, and that's too bad, but you know, it's true because they're, pe they're just people too. And maybe she's going through something where she, you know, whatever the issue is. I'm glad I finally, there is not a whole lot of uh, doctors taking new patients up here right now. Um, there's a few, but not many. So you would think in a big city, Calgary is over 2 million now. It's a pretty big sized city. And it's like, you'd think there'd be, there are lots of doctors. They're just not taking new patients. So <laughs> there is, yeah, it does. You know, I mean, it's kind of like typical, I think. And um, there was this one doctor that I thought, well, okay, I'll give this guy a try. And I went to, just for my first visit and he already, he has all of this stuff that needed to be done lined up. I already got the calls. I got the appointments booked. Um, within the next week, it'll all be done. The stress test, the pulmonary test, all of it. Yeah. That's wonderful news. I know that's going to be a huge relief. <laughs> I know. I'm glad because let me tell you, I'm, I'm I, because I've been feeling so horrible, you know, I mean, just absolutely horrible. And it's not just stress. I mean, some of it is, is stress. I'm sure of it because this last year, because of COVID-19, I haven't been working. And, um, I keep, like I said, I keep looking for jobs. I keep putting the the applications out there, you know, hoping that somebody will call. <laughs> no, they don't call, you know. Um, it's very frustrating. And I think it's just because right now, so many, so because of this COVID-19 thing all around the world, I mean, hey, we're in North America. We're still doing a lot better than a lot of places who don't have anything. Um, there's still jobs. People are still working. But the thing is, is the amount of jobs that closed, all of those people are off. And all the, uh, well, not all of it, but a lot of the aid is kind of gone. Now the government set up, the Canadian government has been very helpful, I have to say. I'm not going to complain at all. Like, um, they've kept me going. I had EI, so I had employment insurance, uh, like unemployment. So, I was, yeah, I was able to collect that um, from last December through, uh, I think it was June or something, like six months. And then this other benefit because of COVID-19 kicked in, the CERB or something, I forget what it's called. Yeah, Canada Emergency Response Benefit, right, for this COVID-19 thing. That kicked in. So just just enough to pay my rent and get something to eat. You know what I mean? So it's just paying rent. It's paying for my internet. It's paying for my groceries. And I'm happy because I'm like, thank God. You know what I mean? Because otherwise I'd be really screwed. <laughs> and, and it's really scary to think how many people worldwide are paddling the this same This is boat. just it. See, the, world, the whole world is in a mess because of this COVID-19. And, you know, in the meantime, it's like you got to keep going, you know. And it's like you nobody just really knows month to month what they're going to be doing. You know what I mean? Um, there are people... You know, I mean, everything's prices are going up because of the problems. I noticed that not everything is going up, but there are some prices in the stores are going up, which for people on fixed incomes, for instance, doesn't, I, I'm just getting help from the government, but let's say seniors, for instance, who, or people who are on, um, you know, like medical insurance, you know, for like, like my husband was for his terminal illness. Um, I forget what you call those uh, benefits like government benefits Here it's disability um, uh, social security if you're older that's what it is disability yeah that type of thing that's, yes that's a fixed income and the costs are going up but that's not going up you know so they have less and less money to work with so i mean it is really affecting everybody it's not just affecting only people that are just losing their jobs um it's just shocking for I can't imagine like being a family right now, you know, one person, oh yeah, I mean, with young children trying to, trying to meet the bills that we were able to meet before, but now can't because you're not bringing in the same income and, you know, it's just, it's just so harsh right now for people, you know, for me, it's just me and my cat in an apartment, you know, like whatever it's, I'm, 
you know, and I grew up poor, so I'm, you know, I'm not looking for all, it doesn't, in other words, it doesn't take much to make me happy. I got a roof over my head, a safe place to sleep, and I've got some food to eat, so I'm actually really happy. Um, but I know that there's one. You have such a positive outlook. I mean, look at everything mm -hmm. that you're going through and yeah, yeah. <laughs> all the things. And lots of, a lot of people are in the same boat, okay? Yeah, I get it. But you have, you know, you're looking at Christmas without your husband again. You, It's just mm -hmm. you and your cat. You've got some friends, but, like, you could be down in the dumps and very depressed and not able to look forward, but you're not. You're No, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> what can you suggest that might help someone else right well, now? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, for one, I try to make sure, I try to make sure, because I live on my own, I don't see people like hardly ever, um, and I don't go out much because of these issues. So I'm, I am on my own really most of the time. There's nobody else that I don't even talk to people unless I'm online talking to somebody for days and days. Yay, online. For so I, find that I, stay, yeah, I stay hooked up online. <laughs> I do. I have a set routine. I make sure I check in in the morning, you know, check in in the evening, say good morning to people, say good night. I make sure that, first of all, and also that it, I, I kind of try to – not just think of myself, you know, because it's so easy to fall into that, you know, what am I going to do? Oh my God. You know what I mean? Or this is horrible. Or be, you know, and it's true. It's okay to feel those feelings. Like I was saying before, you know, if, if you're feeling sad and you're having a sad day, it's perfectly okay to cry because your body, you need to, your body needs to release that. Your spirit needs to release that, whatever it is. So what I'm doing is just allowing myself to, experience the day as it is and and uh not just think of myself but think of other people and try because there's not much i can do to help anybody right now except for to be an encouragement you know what i mean i can't donate money and i can't nope not very many people can even volunteer right now because of this covid19 they're only allowing certain people to be part of volunteer groups who they know don't have it so therefore you can't even really go out and do much volunteering. <laughs> but even if I could, I wouldn't be able to, because it's really like a saying, moving around walking is difficult. So I don't do I do as little as I as I possibly can without so I don't hurt myself because I'm just in pain quite a bit. So I just keep a routine. Um, you know, and if I'm having a, a hard day and you know, just feeling down, I just allow myself to feel it, experience it, grieve it, whatever, mourn it. And yeah, yeah. And just knowing that, you know, everybody has a bad day and we all get down at times, but I don't stay there. And a few months ago, I was on um, one of the NASCA shows that we were on the National Association of Adult Survivors of Child Abuse. I was on there. We were all talking about, the panel was talking about uh, what we were doing to try to get through this COVID-19 and as survivors of abuse, but it could be for anybody, not just survivors of abuse. We all have to get through this COVID-19, right? With sanity and <laughs> yeah. That's right. And we were saying, you know, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm trying to keep a routine. And, you know, it's not like I'm hard on myself. What if I don't get, if I don't do something that I should be doing, I'm, I, I don't worry about it. You know what I mean? I don't, in other words, I'm not putting a lot of pressure on myself unnecessary pressure because there's no there's no point um and just uh staying positive you know this is a, a horrible situation like we don't even know what's going to happen with the vaccine situation some brilliant minds are working on it we just have to let them work and believe that better is coming let's hope so and like it, i think a lot of people have a lot of fear of the unknown and because we don't know what's going to happen you know but when you think about it, none of us ever knew what was ever going to happen. <laughs> and it's tomorrow, like, yeah, definitely. And I mean, when you think about it, it's we don't know about tomorrow. All we know about is today. And so, what I try to do, which is very important to me, so that I don't think 
fall too much into thinking about the past, you know, and then my past wounds from being abused and whatnot. Um, I allow myself to feel what I need to feel, but I don't, I try not to spend all, you know, too much time there. Um, and or thinking too much about the future and becoming in fear of that and all the possibilities that could go wrong. You know what I mean? Because we can all do that too, especially if we're looking at the media. Media is definitely a cause of a lot of people's uh, despair, I think. We have to keep what we listen to in perspective and use the off button and walk away. Yeah, and, and really filter what you're listening to. And a lot of it has got people in just up. They don't even know what they're going to do with themselves because they're watching the news. I'm like, you know, I, I watch very little news. I just watch what I need to watch to stay in tune with what the government wants people to do for COVID-19. I don't pay attention to all the other stuff that's going on. Um, we have the same issues going on up here, just not so much violence as the states. We do have some protests happening. People are protesting the the uh, the COVID-19 uh, regulations. They don't want to wear the masks. You know, the anti-maskers. They think that the government's in a conspiracy to kill everybody. And you know, I, and you know, a lot of leaders of these countries would like the answers. They don't even have the answers. Very true. Problem. And I think that if we're not willing to work together to find a peaceful, you know, positive solution to this mess, you know, I, I don't sit in fear and worry about all this. Other Set stuff. those boundaries. That's smart. Yeah, because that's going to ruin that. That can make a person sick physically. But I think as more, more, you know, even more so mentally and spiritually sick um, to be so fearful of you know, what's going on around us all the time. Um, because as an adult, I have a choice. I think that's the difference. I think, you know, growing up abused, like as a child, you're living in an abusive environment. You're really forced to. You're not in control and you have to learn what to filter out. Yeah, because yeah. when you're a child, you're not, your, bar, your brain hasn't formed enough to where you can actually shut that stuff out. You know what I mean? Or, or decide whether that really is a crisis or it's not. You know what I mean? As an adult, it's like, <laughs> you know, I, I know perfectly well what's a crisis and what's not. Um, and I can choose to let let in what I want and, and keep out what I don't want. So I don't keep a lot of negativity around me. And I keep a, a, a like a lot of, I would not just positivity all the time because there's, you know, that's what a lot of people always say, you know, like, for, especially for people that are grieving or hurting, they're like, oh, it's okay, you'll be fine, you know, just don't think about it, move on, be happy. I, yeah, that I'm not that work. type, you know, but I do, um, I do actually include some positivity in my day, whether it's listening to my favorite music, playing my guitar, I like to practice playing my guitar, um, taking care of my cat. That's a big Aww. blessing for me. Cats I love, so oh, sweet. oh, I love my cat. <laughs> she's my baby. <laughs> I don't have any children. So she's my baby. Good for you. And, yeah. And she's just wonderful. And I love taking care of her and petting her. And I, that's my special time, you know, melts the stress away, you know, to give love, to have something to give love to. And I mean, some people don't even have a pet and they're on their own and they're thinking, well, who can I give love to? It's like, well, whoever you come in contact with, you know what I mean? Like literally the person who contacts you about something, you know, on the phone, show a little love, you know, we can all, because people not only need to receive love, but we human beings were designed to think the human, the heart, you know, what we're made of is designed to give love too. So, to, you know, because you, re you, you receive when you give. So it's, I, I try to remember that sort of stuff. Yeah. So given all that you've been through and experienced in life, I mean, here you are, we're in the middle of a difficult season for a lot of people. What do you do to kind of make it through the holidays? Tell me about that. Well, I would say, I don't, for, for me, I just, I put up my tree and um, if I could spin my computer, you'd be able to see it. <laughs> do you want to see my tree? Sure. Let's see the tree. I'll try not to disconnect here while I'm doing this. I didn't put up a tree for the last two years. And I just decided to. 
Uh, can you see it? <laughs> I just decided to. Yeah. I was actually. It's beautiful. I love the angel yeah. on the top. You've done a great job. Thank you. Yeah, I decided this year to go ahead and do it. Um, because the first year I was grieving and just too hard. And, you know, lots of people have been missing somebody, They've been missing a family member, you know, or their husband or wife, like I said, boyfriend, girlfriend, brother, sister, somebody, or best friend. Um, and I would say, you know, it's okay to shed those tears. If a little tear comes to you while you're thinking about them and a memory comes, it's perfectly okay to shed those tears. And then it's really great if you can remember something funny or fun about them too and laugh a little bit and allow yourself to laugh a little bit about those people. I think it's keeping them alive um, in your heart. They may not be with us now, you know, they may not be here in the, in the flesh anymore. But they're still here. They're still part of us. They're part of our memories. They're still, they're part of our lives, part of my heart, part of your heart. So it's, I think it's important to honor that and to honor the, the, those feelings because they really meant something that that love was real and it is real because I believe is. love is eternal. And so it, it's, it's still that love is still there. For that person so i would say if you're feeling depressed and you really can't cope because some people just you know i've been there <laughs> let me tell you i've been there yeah yep and sometimes mm -hmm. yeah and sometimes you do need to have someone else step in who can help you i know um you know, there's numbers you can call, you know, there's, there's, there's services out there, 1-800 numbers. There's, there's so on. Now I am going to put some of those numbers um, down below in the description box, because there's nothing wrong with asking for help if you need it, whether you're reaching out mm -hmm. to a friend or a support group or some kind of professional help. If those services weren't needed, they wouldn't exist. So, to help with that, we're going to put some numbers down below in the description. That's great, Gail. This was wonderful. But I would say everybody just hang in there. Yeah, keep reaching out. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm going to put your contact information down below, your blog and so forth, so people can get in touch with you because I have loved having okay. you here. <laughs> well, thank you, Gail. It's just, been a pleasure. And I just it's been very nice to spend this time with you. Well, Absolutely. I appreciate you being here because we've known each other all these years and we're just now meeting by video, which is really pretty cool. But I want to invite everybody to subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so and make sure you click like because that lets YouTube like us and we want YouTube to like us. <laughs> because that helps YouTube show the channel more often. So thank you all for doing that and sharing it on social media. Laurie, thank you for being out here. And we'll see you all on the next Bye -bye. video. Bye.